Okay, everyone, what are we doing here? This is the first video I'm making, I'm posting, because I need another outlet to talk to you guys about movies, talk to you guys about television, talk to you guys about all of this shit that I want to talk about. So I figured the best way to get more of my views out there were to maybe occasionally post some video blogs. Uh, I might do quick film reviews, just shoot them on my phone, might do more little written out videos, I'm not exactly sure. Basically, with award season coming, I want to talk more movies, and I want to engage you guys in the discussion, so I figured this was the best way to do it. A little low-tech, kind of lo-fi, just shooting it on my webcam. It's kind of the first time I've ever even used this, in all honesty. I'm a bit of a Luddite, if you haven't figured that out from my Twitter feed or podcast or things like that. But, you know, I was hoping to maybe get an awards discussion show going at some of these outlets that I've worked at before. I'm still working on some things. I might have some shows going somewhere, but as of now, I don't. And quite frankly, I've had a little falling out with one of the places I've worked with, uh, which will become very apparent once Orphan Black comes on. But... Let's talk about movies, and I figured the best way to start this would be to discuss what I thought were the best films of 2015. Now, if you're, if you're watching this, chances are you're a fan of my podcast or you're a fan of uh, my Twitter feed, The Collider Show, and you probably already know what my best films are. But, like I said, I thought this was another fun way to get a little bit more than 140 characters out there to explain. Um, 2015 was such a good year for film. I thought 2014 was a little lackluster, but 2015, it was almost an embarrassment of riches. Uh, these are the films that didn't make my, my top ten. The also-rans, which I think are amazing films. Uh, Diary of a Teenage Girl, dope. The Hateful Eight, a Tarantino film not making my top ten is kind of unbelievable. Uh, Kingsman, I thought was a great... Hollywood kind of fun, surprising film from earlier in the year. The Martian is basically feel-good Hollywood cinema at its best. Didn't make my list. Came close. Didn't make my list. Uh, Kurt Cobain, Montage of Heck. I don't remember the last time a documentary put me so in just a sad headspace of another human being. Didn't make my list. Uh, Spotlight, maybe the most workmanlike film of the year. Brilliant. Probably going to win Best Picture. Didn't make my list. Steve Jobs, another one that came close for me because that Sorkin dialogue really pops. Didn't make the list. Um, Creed. I'm going to get some shit from some of you people about Creed not making the list. Creed is brilliant. I hope Creed gets Oscar nominations. I hope Stallone wins the Oscar. Didn't make the list. The film I was most upset that just missed my top ten was Tangerine, which is... The film that was shot on an iPhone, as you know, it's uh, just a really interesting portrayal of these two transgender women uh, prostitutes out on Santa Monica Boulevard, and it's an interesting glimpse into a life you might not know about, a world you might not know about, and it's just a damn good Los Angeles film. Uh, in fact, on Will Sean Podcast, my podcast, Will Sean Podcast, um... Chris Burgock, the co-writer, producer, we did an extensive interview with him. It's episode 170. We did it last June. Go back and listen to Will Sean podcast. Find it on iTunes. It's a great interview. Didn't make my list. It was like number 11. So what did make my top 10? Well, we're going to get into it real fast here. <laughs> number 10 was The Duke of Burgundy. This was probably the first film I saw in 2015, and it really stayed with me. It's directed by Peter Strickland, and it is a film out of time. If you told me, after watching this film, that this film had been made in the 1970s, I would have totally believed it. It seems timeless in that way, in this, the production design, in the visuals. It's gorgeous. It's about these two women in this BDSM kind of relationship, admittedly a topic of interest to me, 
Uh, but what's interesting is what starts off is just, oh, they're in this dominant submissive relationship. As the film unfolds, you see the different layers of it. You see the person who is the most submissive might not necessarily be the most submissive. And honestly, it turns into a really interesting view of two women in a relationship that may or may not be working at this time. Uh, also, there are no men in the film which is also kind of fascinating, and is something you barely even notice about, and I think that's what's fascinating about it. Um, so that's my number ten. Number nine, youth. I have to admit, going into youth, I thought this stood a chance to be mm, pretentious, maybe something that didn't work for me. You know, uh, Paolo Sorrentino, he's very Fellini-esque, and admittedly, sometimes Fellini works for me, more in theory than in practicality. But I found that this film that takes place about basically these two old men who were great artists, Michael Caine and Harvey Keitel play them. One's a composer, one's a filmmaker. And they're at this spa in the Alps. And there are all these other characters that populate the spa. And it's this beautiful meditation on art and mortality and it made my list because, and this is the reason most of the films that are on my list make the list, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I could not stop thinking about this film, not just the visuals, but the, the relationships that these characters had and the way they spoke of their lives. Uh, Harvey Keitel, in particular, is doing phenomenal work here, and I don't understand why he's not getting more Oscar buzz. Youth is a movie that really stayed with me, uh, brilliant performance all around. Go see it. It's not as pretentious as you think. Number eight for me was Mistress America, which I thought was the funniest film I saw all year. Greta Gerwig is beyond charming, maybe only topped by the charms of Lola Kirk in the film, and they have a great female relationship. What works about the film for me is in the second half, it turns into the best screwball comedy I can think of in decades, if not from since the screwball comedies of the 40s. The characters all find themselves at the same house, and there's kind of this, as they move from room to room, the dialogue just pops, the humor just pops, everything about it works. It's just an absurd situation, but there's emotional heft to it, too, that ends up coming out in a betrayal in that female relationship. Mistress America, I think it's great. I'm in the minority of thinking that it's better than Francis Ha. Huh? I know I get some flack for that, but Mistress America might be uh, my favorite of the Greta Gerwig, Noah Baumbach collaborations yet. Uh, number seven is another documentary for me uh, about a musician. I know I'd mentioned Montage of Heck earlier, but Amy, the, the Amy Winehouse film, and one of the reasons it made my top ten is I liked Amy Winehouse when she first came on the scene, obviously, but I didn't think about how talented she was until seeing this documentary. There's a moment in it where she is singing black-to-back uh Back to Black, sorry. Uh, hearing the music in the headphones, she's singing it a cappella. And it's one of those moments where you see an artist and you realize y you can be a good singer. You can be a good writer. You can be a good painter. And you can learn things to make yourself better. But some people are just born with talent. And in that moment, watching that film, you realize she is doing something that she can never teach. She is doing something that she could never have learned. It just was in her. And it's also a beautiful movie about the relationship we have with artists. And how, you know, I mean, this was a troubled woman. And there are late night talk show hosts making fun of her. And, and it kind of makes you feel bad, not just for her but you kind of feel bad about yourself, that maybe you made a joke about her, maybe you you uh, were flippant about what was wrong with her. Uh, so it's interesting. It's great about how we relate to celebrities, I think is a whole other layer of this documentary, besides just being a beautiful meditation on this woman's life. Speaking of meditations, number six, Anna Melissa. 
I've always been a huge Charlie Kaufman fan, and Animalisa really hit me like a gut punch. Uh, in its sadness, in its desperation, there's a, a moment where the character of Michael is banging on all these hotel room doors, desperate to basically find a human connection, and... You know, I, I've been there. Maybe I've been there by texting people or something. Like, I'll text like 20 people, see who's around tonight. And it, there's something relatable and honest about that. There was also something so beautiful about the way it captures the awkward moments in life. It captures, like, just using a key card in a hotel room door. The, both the comedy and frustration of that. The sex scene is really honest, because it's awkward. It's, you know, it's a little fumbling around. It's a lot of asking, oh, you want me to do this? You want me to do that? And these imperfect bodies moving. There was something very beautiful and honest about that for me. And they're able to capture all this because of the puppetry, because they have the time to take with every little detail, every little moment. They can create the awkwardness even more. But the puppetry serves another purpose in the film that I don't want to get into in case you didn't see it, but there's a uniformity that is really the reason why you made this film with puppets. Animalisa, my number six film. Number five is probably my favorite horror film in decades. I mean, maybe my favorite horror film since The Blair Witch, and I know a lot of unique great horror films have come out since then, but it follows... I think is just one of the tops I've ever seen. One, the sexual politics of the film are, are fascinating, and also the idea of sex is the disease, but also the cure. Sex is the thing that gives you this creature that is following you, but also it's the way to get rid of it. Uh, and and uh, Mika Monroe uh, gives what I think is a star-making performance. David Robert Mitchell has also made this kind of a film out of time. You watch this film, and you don't know really when it takes place either. One character has like a Kindle-type device, but other than that, the cars, the sets, everything is, is fairly antiquated, which kind of is unnerving in a weird way. Uh, not having, I think in a horror film, The Shining is another film that does this really well, where, where you can't really get a, a, a place of the geography or the, the, the time, and you're kind of put in this weird headspace. It follows, does that so well. Also, the music, the score by Disaster Piece, it'll never win an Oscar, but it should. It's this great 80s John Carpenter-esque score that really comes in at all the right moments and just sets that, again, that kind of antiquated mood in another strange way. After seeing It Follows, I'm not going to lie, I was walking down the street and I was, I was doing a little bit of this, making sure some sex demon creature wasn't following me. Uh, amazing film. Number four is Brooklyn, which is another film that I think is so high up because it so surprised me. I, I remember seeing the trailers and thinking, it looks slight. Like, how good could this movie really be? And phenomenal. It is phenomenal in its simplicity. The whole film is basically Shorsha Ronan trying to decide, not just between two men, but between two homes. The world she lived, grew up in, in Ireland, and her new home of Brooklyn. There are no real villains. The romance is very chaste. It's just a beautifully told, simple story uh, that works on all levels and touched my heart. If you haven't seen Brooklyn, go see it. Again, it's almost a hard film to describe because so it's so simple, but that's where its beauty comes in, and it shows we can do a lot with a little. There's a moment where she opens a drawer in the film, and it's kind of, what's in the drawer is kind of a mini shocking moment. I won't give away if you haven't seen it. And audiences gasp at it. And it's just a simple act of opening a drawer. It's just what great filmmaking, what you can do with great filmmaking in a simple story. Number three is Room. This was the most emotionally devastating experience for me at a theater all year. Um, it's about, you know, Brie Larson plays a woman who has been kidnapped for the past seven years and is, for the last five, has been raising her son, uh, played by Jacob Tremblay, in 
this very, I think it's like 10 by 10 room that she's been kept in. And it's about how they try to escape room. A lot of people I know have been resistant to see this because, you know, child in peril, it doesn't sound like a good time at the movies. This isn't the film you think it is. This is ultimately, to me, such a life-affirming movie, such a beautiful movie. And Brie Larson is... There, there were a lot of great actresses this year. Shoshi Ronan in Brooklyn, uh, Belle Powley, Diary of a Teenage Girl. But to me, Brie Larson has to do so much. She has to do so much for her own character, but also for her son in this. She has to put on this facade, but she's dying inside almost this whole time. And maybe she can't handle being outside of room. I mean, there's this kind of institutionalized idea. Uh, you're, you're in the space for so long, how can you handle the real world again? Uh, it's so powerful, and I urge you to see it. I think Brie Larson is going to sweep award season. And quite frankly, uh, it was the best performance I saw all year, which is another reason it is so high on my list at number three. <laughs> number two, now we're getting to the nerdy stuff. Now we're getting to the geek stuff that doesn't usually come this high on my list, but this year there were some phenomenal tentpole Hollywood films. I mentioned The Martian earlier, for example. But number two, Star Wars The Force Awakens. What can I say about this that hasn't been said yet in my Twitter feed in a million arguments with people who might not have liked it as much as me? Admittedly, the film is high because it means so much to me personally, having another Star Wars film up there uh, to talk about something that, you know, kind of washed away the bad taste of the prequels, which I will also argue those prequels are not unwatchable movies. They're not shit fests. They're just not... Star Wars. They're not what we want out of Star Wars. This is everything we want out of Star Wars. Uh, first of all, some people have complained at Apes. You know, it's a little derivative from A New Hope. Maybe. But isn't A New Hope derivative from Buck Rogers and Samurai films anyway? Yeah, it's the hero's journey. And quite frankly, if you didn't kind of ape a new hope if you didn't kind of keep it within that realm. The same people complain about this would be complaining it doesn't feel like Star Wars. And if you needed to set up a new trilogy, the best way to do it is give us something familiar. And that's what it did. It gave us something beautifully familiar with enough new flourishes to get us excited. And those new flourishes come in the characters of Finn. They come in the character of... of um, Ray, in particular, and Kylo Ren, Kylo Ren, who is everything that young Anakin should have been in the prequels. Um, the relationship and the camaraderie between Finn and Ray is what really sells the movie, though. These two have so much chemistry. In fact, the whole cast has brilliant chemistry. That's what was lacking in those prequels. I don't know if it was Lucas's fault. I don't know if it's that Hayden Christensen isn't the greatest actor. But there was no chemistry. This, the second Ray and Finn get together is when I knew this was going to end up being not just a good movie, but a great film. Because they pop immediately. I love Star Wars Force Awakens. It, it. You know what? It's a gut punch, too, in a lot of ways, because the last scene really hit me on an emotional level that maybe another Star Wars film hasn't. And admittedly, it's because I bring baggage, I bring nostalgia to it. But, you know, film is history, and we can't deny that we have knowledge of the history that came before it. So, Star Wars, Force Awakens, number two, I'll fight anyone who says differently. So what movie do I give number one to, if not Star Wars? Mad Max Fury Road. Which is another, for me, a little nostalgic because I, in high school, was obsessed with the Mad Max films. We had a high school film teacher who showed us all the Mad Max films. And she really kind of showed us how they were post-apocalyptic westerns in a weird way. You know, Max would always roll into a new situation, like kind of the gunslinger running into town, and he'd get caught up with the people that, you know, he wants to keep moving, but nope, he's got to stay and help them, and that's exactly what this is. Basically, it's a stagecoach moving through the desert that Max ends up on, just like John Wayne in the movie Stagecoach, and now he's got to help Imperator Furiosa and all the brides who have escaped along the way. 
this is the most kinetic movie of the year, maybe ever. And the fact it's made by a man in his 70s who's driving these rigs through the desert and George Miller is equally unbelievable. It is a vision. It is also as broad and big as the action sequences are. The film is oddly subtle. A regular Hollywood film, or a lesser Hollywood film, would go through a big explanation of the war boys and what's wrong with them. You know, this film just gives you enough... Uh, it, it treats the audience smart enough to know that they're just going to realize these war boys are all cancer-riddled. You know, that their bodies are falling apart. Uh, like I said, a lesser film would have gone into a big explanation. Nicholas Holt's character would have told a big story. Uh, this, he just points to two tumors on him. Story's done. Well acted from top to bottom, just exciting as hell, and god damn, isn't it great to see actual cars exploding, actual people falling off of them, not CGI? This was the most exciting film of the year. In many ways, it also has, I think, a very beautiful ending to it. I loved, loved, loved Mad Max Fury Road. I saw it three times in the theater. I've seen it since on DVD. Uh, I'm going to keep watching it. I think it should win Best Picture. I think it's going to get nominated. We'll see. Um, who knows by the time you're watching this, it already has. Maybe it has won Best Picture. It won't. Spotlight will win Best Picture. But, you know, you could dream. So that's it. That's my top ten films of the year. Again, I don't know how much you're going to be able to tolerate just looking at my face and me talking. But, um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you did, I'm going to start trying to make more videos. I think it's a little bit more of a fun way for me to communicate than just typing up a blog and, and posting it. So we will see. Uh, this is, again, this is a grand experiment. This is my first video blog. Uh, hopefully I can get going at some other places where maybe I can do this in a studio. I'm working on it, people. Uh, until then, listen to me on the Will Sean podcast at iTunes. Uh, back in March, I'm going to be back at Collider doing Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And uh, I'm working on trying to find a new place for my Orphan Black show. Maybe my Orphan Black reviews will end up just being here, too. Who knows? We'll figure it out. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, see you uh, next time. <laughs>